Today is going to be an interesting day, talking about politics. Uh, if you are particularly politically aware or active or thinking, uh, like me, for example, I, I studied politics at university a long time ago, it was back in the 90s. Different world today <laughs> to back then. Um, <clears throat> but in, in some senses, very, very similar still. Some senses more, more divided along political lines in our culture today than we were even a decade ago, let alone back in the 90s, like a generation ago, uh, when we could talk about politics kind of abstract from our identity a little bit. Whereas these days, it seems to be there's more dividing over politics than even over theology, where you might align yourself with someone who is more politically aligned to you, uh, but who you disagree with significantly on other incredibly important matters, even theological, like who is Jesus, uh, than you would about who is Jesus. So today I want to look at, I want to go back, uh, have a look at how did the Christians, the early Christians talk about politics, how might we learn from them, what that might mean for us today. So uh, again, if, you, if you're politically minded, um, you're probably going to be disappointed maybe in the sermon today because there's a very good chance I'm not going to back your preferred political persuasion or preferred political personality or party. Um, but what I hope to do is I hope to look into scripture and help us understand uh, how might God have us think about politics. So let me pray and then we're going to get stuck into it. And so Father, I want to ask for your help today. For all of us, please Lord, keep us attentive to your Holy Spirit. Open hearts and minds to your scriptures today and to your spirit uh, leading us and guiding us. We don't want to be swayed away from the truth. We don't want to be deceived in any kind of way. Father, we don't, we don't want to put our hope in any other name but the name of Jesus. So it's in his name we ask and in his name we pray. Amen. Alrighty, so back in the day, Back in the day, the early Christians, <clears throat> they would say things like this. This is Paul writing to the church in Philippi. God highly exalted him, talking about Jesus, and gave him the name that's above every name, so that, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Or like Peter and John before the Jewish leadership, <clears throat> where they would say things like this, recorded in Acts 4. Uh, this Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. And so they say things like this a lot. Jesus is Lord. There is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved other than the name of Jesus. And Peter, Paul, and John, they're all living at a time and a place where Rome and where Caesar ruled. Uh, if, you're, if you're aware of you know, the history of the world or certainly Christian history or Jewish history, you'll know this is the context in which they're writing. These statements that they're making are absolutely theological and we, we know they're theological. <clears throat> Talking about Jesus is Lord and they're going to say, who is Jesus? He is God himself who has come to dwell among us and be our God, our Saviour. There's no other name under, under heaven in which by which man can be saved other than Jesus, we, we take that theologically, rightly theologically, and we say, yes, he is our ultimate and only hope. He is our great saviour. He has saved us from sin. He saved us from death. He saved us to himself. Wonderful. These things they tell us about God, these, these consistent and constant phrases of the early church tell us about God, they're deeply theological, but also they are deeply political. How do I know this? Well, let's have a look. Two millennia, half a world removed. We can see and hear the theological aspects of those statements. We might be missing in their context under the Roman Empire, under Caesar's rule, their political context and how that might help us to engage with politics today. One commentator writes this. <coughs> Back in the day, in the day of Rome, when your tribe or your kingdom submitted to Roman peace. So there was a 
an element of the Roman Empire, Pax Romana, the, the peace of Rome. And what the peace of Rome really meant was, if we rule you, there'll be no fighting. Here's a great way to have peace. We'll just be the boss of everyone. And if you don't want to submit to us, we'll just come in and we'll take peace, if you like. This is the peace of Rome. So this commentator says, when your tribal kingdom submitted to the Roman peace, Rome would nail their euangelion or their good news. They would nail their evangelistic statement, their gospel announcement to a post for all to see. On it, you would read these words. There is no name under heaven by which you can be saved, save for Augustus, Caesar. You would receive his salvation by having your tribe admit to the fact that Caesar is Lord. Now, Caesar Augustus also had a name that went alongside him. He was called the Divi Filius, a name in reference to his adoption under Julius Caesar, who was believed to be a god. So Caesar Augustus, the Divi Filius, Caesar Augustus, the son of God. That's what the, the commentators are saying. Helping us to kind of put our mindset back in the day of Peter, James, uh, Peter uh, John and Paul, <clears throat> who made these statements like, Jesus is the Lord. There is no, under, no other name under heaven by which someone can be saved other than Jesus. And these statements come after the peace of Rome come after these statements that are well known throughout the whole empire. In Acts 17, it's recorded Paul visits the Thessalonians. Some Greeks believe. Some of the Jews became very jealous, go looking for Paul. And Acts 17, verse 6, this is what it says. When they didn't find him, they dragged Jason, who was Paul's host in Thessalonica, and some of the other brothers before the city officials shouting, these men have turned the world upside down. They've come here too. And Jason's welcomed them. They're all acting contrary to Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, Jesus. The crowd and the city officials who heard these things were upset. Or if you take the, the time when, just before his crucifixion, Jesus meets Pilate, the Roman official, and they have a discussion about authority and kings and kingdoms. And Jesus says to Pilate, you have no authority, but was given by he who sent me. So Jesus makes this <clears throat> theological and political statement saying, I, I acknowledge you have authority, but your authority is gifted to you by a higher authority, not Caesar, <clears throat> but by the one who sent me, by God himself. In fact, this is an echo of uh, a, a consistent refrain throughout the Old Testament that it is God himself who places kings and rulers in their place. He establishes their kingdoms. He plots out their territories. He marks out their times. And that's, it's God above any other ruler or authority who gives authority to other rulers. And the Jews say to Pilate, if you don't kill him, you're no friend of Caesar. And they say, we have no king but Caesar. They're saying, Jesus isn't Lord. Caesar is Lord. That's so all we miss two millennia and half a world away <clears throat> is the, uh, we, we get the theological significance, hopefully. We talk about it all the time. And what we potentially miss when we don't understand the context in which they're saying these deeply theological words uh, is how rooted in politics they are. This has become the cry of our day. We have no king but Caesar. Not our cry, but the cry of our culture around us. Saying, no, no, we don't, we don't, we're not beholden to some distant deity. Uh, the government is our authority. We, we don't just submit, we cede, we, we invest all of our power into our government, into the rulers. Our hope for tomorrow is based on who's in power today. And so what we want to do is invest and, and impute more authority and give more authority to our government. And then we want to get control of the government so that we are in power. You just got to consider some of the scenes over the last couple of years when various political decisions have been made in Australia and around the world. 
when different elect, like <clears throat> referenda or elections have happened in certain places, and you think about the, the existential consternation of people whose preferred politicians or, or parties aren't voted in, the despair people have, we are ruined every single election seems to be the most important election of all time because we have invested more and more, given, ceded more authority and power into those human institutions. We have no king but Caesar is a cry of people on the side of power who want to get that power or at least be on the side of that power to, to do whatever they want to do. It's not a new way of thinking. It's the same way of thinking we hear echoed in the Jews in the time of Rome. We have no king but Caesar. What a crazy thing to say. The government will fix it. The government will save us. This has become, in Australia at least, kind of the default understanding. So that when crises happen, there tends to be this acquiescence of, or, or this kind of um, attitude of, oh, well, they're the ones in power. They get to make the decisions. And amongst the citizenry, we have this kind of sense of, uh, before it could be, well, we disagree, but we could still be friends. Uh, we disagree politically. Uh, well, you know, what, what's the best kind of economic policy? We can disagree. What's the, what's the best environmental policy? We can disagree. Still, you know, have a barbecue together or sit around a family dinner table together. These days, it seems to be more of a, sense of, if you disagree with me politically, then you're my enemy. You're not just wrong, you're evil. And this isn't hyperbole. People, I hear this all the time from people in person, uh, people in the news, people on social media. If you don't like this policy, you're racist. If you don't like this policy, you want your granny to die. I'm not trying to pick on one side. Uh, it's across the political spectrum. If my political party doesn't get into power, the world's going to end. Has become our way of thinking in the West because we have put so much power, or at least in our thinking, into the governing authorities. We have no king but Caesar. Here's the good news of the gospel. There was the gospel of Caesar Augustus, and that was peace has finally arrived because we've conquered you. Or, or you've ceded power to us. Here's the good news. You are under my protection. You're under my rule and reign. Uh, as long as you say Caesar is Lord, you're going to have a good time. And then this other gospel comes in. The good news about Jesus. Jesus is Lord. Actually, Jesus has saved you. He is, he's not just an authority that is a conquering authority. He is the name that is above every other name. This is the good news. There is another king. The Jews were complaining about the Christians saying there's another king. That's the best news, there's another king. The best news isn't that Caesar is Lord. Caesar's been dead for 2,000 years. Jesus died and rose again and rules and reigns. God himself has come to dwell among us and among many other things, the government will be upon his shoulders. So when we look at Jesus as king, Jesus is Lord, it means that Caesar is not means that government isn't ultimate. Uh, and in fact, it was a statement of treason for the early Christians. This is why they kept getting into trouble. Often, it was because they were upending what had become, in, in a sense at least, a very peaceful uh, society by saying there's a different king, there's another Lord. In fact, you, you could worship all kinds of gods in Rome as long as the state, as long as the government, as long as Caesar held your ultimate authority. So if you said Caesar is Lord and they would take you and they would put you in prison until you said, until you renounced Jesus as Lord and said, well, yeah, I can worship Jesus so long as Caesar has my ultimate allegiance, has his ultimate authority in my life. Francis Schaeffer, he uh, commented that Christians weren't killed so much for, worship, for worshiping Jesus, but for disrupting the unity of the state centered in the formal worship of Caesar. We see this in our day today. Go to places like North Korea where they have gotten rid of all of the Christians because the Christians wouldn't say government is Lord. They said Jesus is Lord. You look at China where they have expelled all of the Christian missionaries because they said 
the government isn't Lord. Jesus is Lord. And the Christians who remain are all on the ground or they say, yeah, we can worship Jesus on the one hand, but also the government is king on the other. People who have a higher authority are necessarily a threat to someone or a group of people who want unchallenged authority. And this is what we see happening in the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago. It's what we see happening across the world in various capacities today. Jesus as Lord is a wonderfully theological statement and also a deeply political statement. The people with another king, King Jesus, they have a commission from that king. We call it the Great Commission, recorded in Matthew 28, where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So imagine that. Again, we take that as a, as a theological statement, and it is. But consider the political ramifications of that statement. Jesus saying, all authority has been given to me. Across the earth and in heaven. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Not just the Jewish people, but uh, where every authority is already established, go and tell them there's another king. And then he goes on and says, uh, make them disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they, they declare allegiance to this new king, Jesus, and they publicly display that they are sharing in his death and sharing in his resurrection. And then he says, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. So it's not an allegiance where you just tick a box and you go about your life. It's an allegiance where you say, I have a new king and he has commands. There is a new allegiance to Jesus alone. What does that mean for us today? Who here just has no interest in politics? Anyone falling asleep already? Nobody? What does it mean for us today? Peter picks up this thinking and what he says, and then what Paul says, we'll read in a minute, you might think, oh, this, how does that work? We have a new allegiance, a new king. Jesus is king. Government is not. Caesar is not. How then does he say, 1 Peter 2, be subject for the Lord's sake, so submit for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as, set, as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, living as servants of God. Honour everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honour the emperor. Look at that in a second. Romans 13. Uh, this is Paul now writing. He calls ruling authorities, kings, governors, politicians. He calls them ministers. We still use this word today, actually. Ministers. It means servant. So we have people who serve the community by leading with the authority from God. Uh, in the church, we call them ministers. So I'm a minister. And we have people who serve the community by leading with God-given authority in the government, and we call them ministers as well. Both appointed by God, God who has the ultimate authority, Jesus, the name that's above every other name, who has all authority in heaven and on earth. And he establishes kings and kingdoms. Even back in Daniel, Daniel recognizes this, talking to King Nebuchadnezzar, he says, God changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Where every election... And increasingly so, because we've again invested so much into politics, we sit on like, a, like on the edge of our seat every election going, oh my goodness, is our guy going to get in or is the world going to end? But the disposition of the Christian should be no election result is ever a surprise to King Jesus. He establishes kings and kingdoms. He establishes rules and reigns that are underneath his own authority. And so Paul writes, Romans 13, let everyone submit to the governing authorities. Since there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. 
So then the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the one in authority? Do what's good, and you have its approval. For it is God's servant for your good, God's minister for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant. It's God's minister, an avenger that brings wrath on those, on the one who does wrong. Therefore, you must submit, not only because of wrath, not only because they will the sword, not only because in our day they've got the guns, but also because of your conscience. And for this very reason, you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's servants, God's ministers, continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone, taxes to those who owe taxes, uh, to those who you owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls, respect to those you owe respect, honour to those you owe honour. So what Paul is saying is, the authorities are given their authority by God for our good, to wield the sword, to protect their citizens from evil doers. So there's a few implications here. He says, so you must submit. We are people who live with another king. And he says, but also submit to this king. We don't get to choose which government we do and don't submit on, submit to based on whether or not we deem them to be godly. <clears throat> we must submit as if they're appointed by God to the degree that they operate within their God-given authority. So God, it's God who establishes governments. He has given them authority and we are to live under and submit to their authority while they govern within the limits of their authority. Consider this is Paul. Paul's writing to a church in Rome under a Caesar. Uh, so they're in a city in which one day he will be in prison under an emperor who will one day have him killed. And he is saying, even staring down the barrel of that future, submit to that government. How do we do this? Our submission is not based on the goodness of the government. Our submission is based on Jesus' rule and reign. And so citizens, uh, Christians should be the best citizens. We should absolutely be the best citizens, obeying and honouring governing authorities who rule in their God-appointed authority. That's what John Dixon says about the early Christians. He says, the early Christians of, say, the first 300 years, sat so loosely to temporal authority, not because they had a slave mentality, as Nietzsche imagined, or because religion was an opiate that dulled them to social reality, as Marx thought, but because they knew that true power to change the world resides not in politics, the judiciary, or the military, or in our day, maybe the media, but in the God of love, and it is called to pray, serve, persuade, and humbly suffer, and history proved them right. And that's why Christians should be the nation's most relaxed and cheerful citizens, especially in times of political uncertainty. What does that mean for us, and how do we do this? First, we want to say we need to pray. Paul writes to Timothy, a leader in the church, and he says this, first of all, before anything, I urge you that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and it pleases God our Saviour. We're obliged to pray for our leaders. Increasingly so, uh, in the West and in Australia, probably more so or for a longer time in Australia, we're very antagonistic towards our politicians. They are, and perhaps rightly so, among the least respected, least trusted professions of any profession in our country. Uh, we make fun of them. It's a national pastime in our media, our, co our comedians, just citizen to citizen to make fun of our, and to disrespect our politicians. And Paul writes to like his spiritual son, and he says, not us. We pray for them. We uphold them. Prayer, H.B. Charles Jr. He says, prayer is our Christian duty. 
It's an expression of submission to God and dependence upon Him. For that matter, prayer is arguably the most objective measurement of our dependence on God. Think of it this way. The things you pray about are the things you trust God to handle. The things you neglect to pray about are the things you trust you can handle on your own. So what he's saying is, uh, when you don't pray, we're effectively saying to God, I don't need you in this, I got it. God, I don't need you in our political process, I got it. I can argue, I can vote, I don't need you, God. Or this person's not on our team. They're doing things that are objectively evil. I'm not gonna pray for them, except maybe they you know, get hit by the proverbial bus or something. But we, have to, we must pray. What else? We've got to pay tax. He says, for this reason you pay taxes, since the authority is a God's servant, continually attending to these tasks, pay obligations to everyone. Taxes to those you owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls, respect to those you owe respect, honour to those you owe honour. Now, I'm not saying that don't use, you know, the regulation of the day to minimise the tax you pay because there are, you know, rules and regulations there for that purpose. But I'm saying don't, like, dodgily avoid paying tax. Jesus also said, give to Caesar what is owed to Caesar. Give to God what's owed to God. What else, what else we do? We can appeal to authority as well. We see this happen actually uh, quite a lot in Scripture. Humbly and boldly, though, not brashly. So Paul before Felix, Paul goes before uh, one of the Roman officials and he humbly appeals. He says, oh, I, I am in this uh, judicial process, or political process even, uh, I, I'm going to make my case before the authorities. I'm not going to talk about them, joke about them, tear them down behind their back. I'm going to go to them and say, I don't think you're operating according to the authority you have. Something else has happened. Consider Moses before Pharaoh. He goes to Pharaoh and says, hey, Pharaoh, uh, I, I respect you're in charge of this locality and these people at this point of time under God and I request you let us go and worship our God. He goes and appeals to authority. We see this actually quite a lot. And we have absolutely the right to do this as Christians, as citizens. What else? We also, when government goes outside as God-given authority, we need to resist. This is not this is not uh, in conflict with what Peter and Paul and John have said before when writing and saying we need to submit, we need to honour the emperor, honour the governments that God has put in charge. He's given them a particular authority specifically to protect, uh, we would say, life and liberty and maybe property or freedom. And to the degree that they're operating within their God-given authority, we need to submit to them. And when they start operating outside of their God-given authority, if they're operating outside of their God-given authority in a way that we disagree with, we absolutely can resist. In fact, in some regards, we must resist, actually. When they go outside of their God-given authority, governments or rulers are then claiming, well, I reject God's authority over me. And in fact, I set myself up in the place of God. So what happens when governments or rulers operate outside of their God-given authority? They're saying, oh, I'm taking the place of God. I'm going to decide where the limits of my authority reside. They should be resisted and not obeyed when operating outside of their authority. Whenever an authority commands what God forbids or forbids what God commands, we have an obligation to resist. I'm not saying we do it brashly. I, I, just like with, with appealing, we need to do it humbly and boldly. Again, those things are not in contention or competition with each other. Humbly and boldly resist when governments or rulers command what God forbids or forbid what God commands. Consider, I love the example of the Hebrew woman in Moses' time uh, under the rule and reign of the Pharaoh. And Pharaoh comes to them and says, any males born, you've got to kill them. Kill all the, ma- all the new male babies, these Hebrew midwives. And the Hebrew midwives, do they submit? They do not. 
Pharaoh is operating outside of his God-given authority. He is commanding what God forbids. And so they don't do it. And when the authorities come to them and say, what's going on? All these baby boys are still being born. They lie and say, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. The Hebrew women, they don't like other women. By the time we get there, the babies are already born and they're on their way. What can we do? So they resist. They lie. And God rewards them, the scripture says. Because of their resistance, God blesses them with family. I'm not saying go make a practice of lying. I'm saying when government or authority commands what God forbids or forbids what God commands. Like I, I've heard people say things like, oh, we can't lie. And so if I was there in you know, Nazi Germany and they come knocking on the door, then obviously I'm going to tell them the truth. Oh, yeah, I'm hiding, I'm hiding Jewish people in my basement. I'm like, you're an idiot. No, when government or authorities are operating outside of their God-given authority, we have an obligation to resist. Back to Acts 4, where Peter and John, uh, they say, we must. The authorities come to them and say, you can go, you can go, but we are forbidding you from saying that Jesus is Lord. We are forbidding you from this new, competing good news or gospel. You, got it, you can't do it. And they say, uh, you are forbidding what God commands. They say, we must obey God and not man. They don't say disrespectfully, but humbly and boldly resisting the rulers operating outside their authority by forbidding something that God has commanded. And so what I'm trying to say is, I'm, ho I'm hoping that I'm just echoing the scriptures here, that our ordinary practice as Christians is to be the best citizens, the ones who we don't put our hope in the political process. We are peaceful participants, not anxious participants in the political process. We can, uh, we can vote our conscience and come together on a Sunday with people who voted differently and figuratively hold hands while we worship the Father. Shoulder to shoulder, like hands in the, hands in the air worshiping Jesus together because our association is not wrapped up in our political association. Let's wrap up in the new and better king. What about separation of church and state? Great question. Let me do something I didn't think I'd ever do. Quote from the Australian Constitution. This is what it says, section 116. Uh, the Commonwealth shall not make any law establishing any religion or for imposing any religious observance or for prohibiting the free exercise of any religion and no religious test shall be required as a qualification for any office or public trust under the Commonwealth. So sometimes I hear people saying things like, well, when you come in Australia in 2023, when you come to the political process, you've got to leave your religion behind. You, you can say, just like back in Rome, you can say Jesus is Lord over there. We don't care about that. So long as when you come here, you acknowledge that government is the highest authority. That's not what separation of church and state means. That's not what our constitution says. Our constitution says the exact opposite of that. Separation of church and state is the inversion of that. It's saying there is no barrier because of who you say is Lord for your engagement and you're speaking into the political process, even becoming a, an elected representative yourself. No religious test is what it's saying. It's not about Christians staying out of politics, nor is it about keeping Christian ideas out of politics. It is the opposite. It is so the separation of church and state is to prevent Christian ideas from being excluded. That's what it means. It means that there's no provision or test of religion that might prevent participation in the political process. It doesn't mean that they should be separate things that happen. Here's the, here's the lie or the misunderstanding in, in how separation of church and state has been misunderstood. The lie is that there is somehow... There's like a neutral worldview. That's the political process. There's a neutral worldview. And <clears throat> it's based on rationality, it's based on science, it's based on reason. And, and, and people in the political process, 
possibly aided by people in academia, possibly aided by people in uh, you know, media, they are the holders of this neutrality. And so long as we can keep that foolish religious thinking out of our neutral, rational, science-based perspective and worldview, we will lead, it will lead to human flourishing. But the reality of the situation is there is no neutral worldview. There are only competing worldviews. The neutral worldview of ancient Rome was Caesar is Lord. That was the neutral perspective. That was the state-backed, media-backed, everybody, fear-backed uh, perspective. Caesar is Lord. And here comes this competing worldview. No, no, it's not that Caesar is Lord is the neutral and Jesus is Lord is the challenge. It's that they are all in the marketplace of ideas. Competing worldviews. So don't buy the lie that there is some secular, scientific, rational, base, neutral worldview. There are only competing worldviews. This neutral worldview doesn't exist. And if there is a default, natural, neutral worldview, it's the one that's established and instigated by the Creator. Separation of church and state, it's important for the church too, so that we don't collectively or even individually fix our position to a place on the political spectrum and we don't hitch our wagon to a particular political party hoping in that person or in that party to bring about outside of uh, the authority of God some sort of preferred peaceful future. That's what the Romans were doing with Rome and with Caesar. When Christians do this, we tend to then, when we've kind of planted our flag in a political party or on, somewhere on a political spectrum, when the party moves or when the personality moves, we tend to move with them in a way that if we were to look at that objectively, we might, uh, might cringe out. We might, we might never have gone that way before, but because we have attached ourselves to a political party or a poli somewhere on a political spectrum or a political personality, and, and we said, no, well, we're, we're just backing this person. When that person moves or changes or says something that is not right or anti-gospel, uh, we, we are hitched to them. It's not helpful for us. We need to maintain a prophetic voice in the political sphere. Consider, I mean, the last couple of years, egregiously, the Russian Orthodox Church coming out and saying, this Russian invasion is a holy war. And the Metropolitan, which is like their version of you know, the, the Pope, I guess, although they would hate for me to say that, so I'm only saying that so that you get the context, said, uh, you want your sins absolved? Go fight in the war. Horrific anti-gospel, way outside of his authority to say something, again, egregious, grievous to the Holy Spirit and to the gospel because that church has hitched its wagon to a particular politician and a particular political party. They no longer can speak prophetically into the political process. So I'm not saying don't be involved in politics. Absolutely, we need Christians involved in politics. So I just talked about separation of church and state. We have to try to convince you that you do not need to stay silent. In fact, the world needs your voice, needs your prophetic voice, because otherwise we cede our, our gospel witness to this, again, false idea that there's some neutral worldview, this secular, scientific, rational worldview uh, that, is, that is the default and we say, well, we shouldn't participate in that. No, not at all. That is just another competing worldview. It doesn't lead to flourishing. It doesn't lead to peace with God. We need your voice. And I'm not saying don't belong to a political party either. What I'm saying is when you're in a political party, don't tether yourself to the party. I'm not saying don't have a favourite politician or a politician that you support or even give money to. Go, go for it if you want to do that. What I'm saying is when that politician says something that is that is anti-gospel or operates outside of their authority, have your allegiance so firmly attached to King Jesus that you can say, I like what you're doing over here and that's not right over there. 
We have to. Otherwise, we lose all credibility in the marketplace of ideas. What I'm saying is our allegiance is to Jesus. We don't want to shift and waver with a changing political wind, with a changing Overton window, with a political party or a public figure that has captured our attention or affection or imagination and then begins down a path that we shouldn't follow if our allegiance is to King Jesus. Jesus is Lord. We're his people. And again, that's why I love that we have people in this room who can disagree politically, who maybe belong to different political parties. Uh, I know we've got people in our church who are politicians, uh, who, who have been ministers, as we, uh, as we looked at earlier. And yet we don't hitch our wagon to them politically, but because we're brothers and sisters in Jesus under our greatest allegiance. That's why we say Jesus is Lord. So we say there is no other name under heaven by which someone can be saved other than the name of Jesus. And so let's be attentive to politics. Let's be engaged in politics. Let's prophetically, with the gospel, the greater gospel, speak into politics. Uh, but let's not put our hope in politics. Let's not ever pledge our allegiance to politics or parties, um, platforms or public figures, uh, but only to King Jesus. Let's pray together. And so, Father, uh, we need your help with this. We need your help. Please keep our hearts captive to the greatest love of all. Help us, Father, to know when to submit, to know when to resist, to know when to appeal. Remind us, Father, to pray. Help us be disciplined in praying for those who are in authority over us. We don't want to uh, balk against the authority that you've established and so rebel against you. But we want to submit where we need to submit. Honour where we need to honour. Help us to be the best citizens, Lord. We'll be engaged in human flourishing across the, the political spectrum. And Father, we have a bold and humble prophetic voice. Always proclaiming the name that's above all names, always being about your mission in the world, ready to obey your commands over every other command. Lord, help us to not falter or waver in our obedience to you when it is politically or socially costly. Help us. Father, in every way, when we do need to uh, resist, help us to do it in a way that brings you honour and glory, not in a way that is combative or doesn't represent you well. And Father, we do ask on behalf of our rulers, our councils and councillors, our state government and politicians, our federal representatives, uh, even those who represent us on an international stage, Father, we pray for all of them. Please help them. Firstly, I'm asking that you would place Christians around them to speak into their worldview. I'm asking that they have soft hearts and minds to your Holy Spirit and to the gospel. Lord, I'm asking we'd have our Christians in the political process who don't waver, who aren't jerks or combative, but who humbly yet boldly proclaim truth. And that our leaders, Father, I'm just praying for all of them, uh, that, that they would come to know you as their Lord and King. Let's see that our ultimate hope isn't in a political process, but in Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.